Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in. I'm Reed Coverdale and you're watching The Naturalist Capitalist. And I've got another special guest on the show today, Elliot Sherman, who is running for U.S. Congress from Texas's second district. How you doing, man? Hey, Reed, thanks for having me today. Uh, you're very welcome. I, I just wanna say I really like you from watching the interviews. I think you're an intelligent, well-spoken guy who uh, the Libertarian Party needs, frankly, because uh, I think the Libertarian Party has kind of been turned into a joke <laughs> since uh, since we had, once Ron Paul disappeared, we've kind of turned into a meme almost. And uh, I'm that's one of the reasons I started my show. I'm trying to bring us away from that. And so I'm really glad to see people like you joining the race who have real practical solutions and aren't just talking about legalizing heroin and uh, rocket launchers. You know, it's good that we go, that we expand beyond that a little bit and show that our solutions really will help people. So uh, why don't you just tell us about who you are, what you do for a living before running for Congress and uh, why you're running for Congress now. All right, thanks. Um, well, just um, to kind of riff on what you mentioned, um, one of the biggest reasons I decided to run was because I was tired of, uh, I guess, seeing the Libertarian Party not being taken seriously and to see people who maybe couldn't articulate ways that could reach people who aren't Libertarians to maybe consider giving us a vote, maybe not in every every race, but take a risk and see, you know, let's like put some Libertarians in power and see what they do and see if maybe things get a little bit better. Um, to uh, get back to your question, though, about like who, who I am, um, uh, I'm a Houston native. Uh, Grew up, I've been in Houston uh, almost my entire life. I did live one year in Indianapolis and one year in Austin, but don't hold that against me. Um, I've uh, got a lot of family here, a lot of a lot of really deep roots. Uh, I got both of my both of my degrees from the University of Houston, go Cougs. Um, and uh, actually, I, I wore my uh, my U of H hat today when I was volunteering. Um, so professionally, I uh, I work in supply chain management as a project manager, and I've been in uh, in that career for about 13 years now. And really, um, something that I, I find intersects nicely between my professional experience and my libertarianism is that uh, I like to figure out ways to make things operate more efficiently and more cost effectively and getting rid of useless bottlenecks or, or obstructions to processes, which I think our government could use a whole lot of. So um, that's, a, that's, that's kind of a motivating factor for me as well. Um, a couple of things that have uh, amused me so far throughout this campaign is uh, people are like, you're, you're a little bit young, don't you think, to be running for this office? And I, I like to point out that the, I'm actually a year older than the incumbent. Um, and I also have actual uh, you know, business experience uh, you know, under my belt with my MBA. So <laughs> there's a little bit about that. So uh, what, are, what, what are your top issues that you're running on? Like give us your top three issues uh, that are the most important to you and what your, what your plans are and your solutions are for those three issues. Well, for me, I don't really think of issues like something like on a restaurant menu. I think of what is a guiding principle and then kind of build out from there, depending on whatever the topic is. And my guiding principle with not just my campaign, but my life in general, is reducing harm to people. Right now, we live under a government that harms a lot of people while operating in, under the auspices that it is trying to help people. And it doesn't really care about the people who get hurt along the way, so long as this, uh, you know, this intention is followed. So um, that being said, there are a couple of ex uh, examples where the government is operating in a way that is really heinous and needs to stop. Um, the number one issue that I like to talk about, though, is um, adopting a humane immigration policy. Right now, we literally have a policy of caging children. That's <laughs> I don't understand how anyone can support that, especially given the fact that it has bipartisan support. This is something that uh, started under the Obama administration and is ramped up to 10 under the Trump administration. And I don't understand how people can morally support a system that rips innocent children away from their families and throws them in cages like animals. That's just completely unacceptable. Um, another area I'd really like to see, uh, see positive change is um, getting rid of uh, victimless crimes. So and th this, this opens up a whole lot of different topics you might, you might um, you know, expect to hear about, but uh, the, the the biggest glaring issue of that is that because marijuana specifically is illegal, we have the biggest prison population on the planet per capita. And that's crazy. Um, so that's a, another example where the government's just hurting people because 
it's trying to enforce something that is, I, I don't know, it is it is harming people. Whereas they what what their actions would be doing aren't harming anyone else necessarily. Right. So another thing we really need to do is we need to bring our troops home. We uh, the United States has not been in a declared war since World War II, <laughs> and uh, for the last you know decades since then we've just had conflict after conflict where american lives are being wasted overseas you've got trillions of dollars of taxpayer money that's just being siphoned away into into defense contractors and weapons manufacturers and you've and you've got lifetimes of people who have a, a resentment towards the united states of america because what we do is we occupy their com their country we bomb them we don't care and then we act like we're bringing them freedom and it's right. it's there it's it's such a a disconnect from what America is supposed to stand for, and I'd really like to see us adopting policies that get us back to things like that respect people's rights and liberty and pursuit of happiness and you know common sense stuff like that, uh, which when you put it, which when you really you know analyze it, libertarians aren't extreme at all. We're just the only sane ones in the room. <laughs> exactly. Um... So your incumbent is Dan Crenshaw, and to me, he represents the quintessential Republican because he talks the game on spending, uh, Second Amendment rights, uh, you know, civil liberties, but then he votes for the CARES Act, he supports red flag laws, um, you know, he's for the Patriot Act. So he's he's just uh, he's just a uh, just the perfect symbol of what that party has become. Um, so do you want to expound, expand on that a little bit? Tell us about your incumbent and why you think he needs to be replaced by you? <laughs> sure thing. Um, the, the biggest thing with Crenshaw, though, is he's he's an actor and he's playing his part, and he's really good at it. Um, yeah. Right now, what works on Republican voters is telling them what they want to hear and then doing you know whatever they want to do once um, once they're in power without anyone paying as much attention. Um, what we need to do is awaken our voters, um, not just Republicans, not just Democrats, not just independents, but people who are registered to vote, who have not, who don't bother getting off the couch on election day and letting letting them know that, you know, your opinion matters. And you need to elect people who are going to follow up with what they say, who aren't just going to tell you sweet lies that you want to hear to get into office. Right. But, you, you did touch on Crenshaw's three biggest weaknesses, in my opinion, is this is a guy who ran who ran on a, uh, a campaign of respecting individual rights. And then he supports red flag laws, which the government being able to show up to your house um, without any charges being filed or any convictions and just taking away your Second Amendment rights, confiscating your guns and property without a warrant. That is a violation of due process. That's a violation of your right to self-defense. And it's the kind of it's the kind of thing where if you uh, in, if you approve of that, then you're basically saying you don't have rights. The government just gives you privileges now and then, and they can revoke them whenever they want. And that's not a good way to look at things. Uh, you also talked about the CARES Act, and this is an idea where it looked like it was a miracle of bipartisan agreement, where they relatively quickly came together to vote on some legislation to help people out during um, you know this this government shutdown. Um, well, government created shutdown is what I should say. So the government created a situation where people literally can't put food on the table for their families. And then they said, don't worry, we'll save you. Um, here's a $1,200 check that your taxes are going to cost $6,000 more next year because of because you're getting this, this little check to help you out during this time of a situation that we created. Sorry, here you go. Um, it's it's completely unacceptable. It's um, it's I would say it's similar to predatory lending, except with predatory lending, the people actually get a choice to sign on that dotted line, <laughs> you know, to get that catch. Uh, so we just have a situation where the government creates a, creates a situation where they they need to come be the saviors, and their method of saving is more destructive than it is helpful. Um, and this is something that uh, Crenshaw didn't just sign; he co-sponsored. So his uh, his daily or weekly rants against socialism and Marxism are quite hypocritical when this guy is spending trillions of dollars of deficit spending money that our, our children and grandchildren are gonna be shackled with having to pay off. Um, and then finally, you mentioned the uh, the Patriot Act. Um, this is, <laughs> it's such a gross violation of civil liberties um, when you have a government that can also, again, without warrant, 
spy on every every American on the internet or on the phone or what you know whatever they want to do. Even people who aren't on the phone or on the internet are having um, communications with you know people who are monitored so that even if even if you try to stay off the grid, you can't even escape it. And the, the complete abuse of due process of self-defense and um, just unreasonable search and seizure are some really basic uh, basic rights that uh, Crenshaw gets wrong. And for those reasons, he doesn't deserve uh, a re-election. I could not agree more. Um, something unfortunate about American politics is we get so hung up on the cult of personality. And Dan Crenshaw is a cool guy. Like, I mean, I completely disagree with him uh, politically, but, you know, he's funny. He's well-spoken. He went on SNL to kind of make fun of himself. You know, he's gone on Joe Rogan. He, you know, he had that viral video with Bill Maher where he was holding his own. So even though he has these terrible ideas, he's a guy I'd love to sit down and have a beer with. And unfortunately, Americans really care about that. So what are you going to do to counter that? I mean, you seem likable enough yourself, but what are you going to do to uh, overcome that ridiculous uh, prerequisite to being acceptable, <laughs> I guess? Well, I, I like to think I'm pretty acceptable, too. I and mean, if, if, uh, if Dan and I were standing side by side and, um, and someone was asked, you know, which guy looks like he's a more reasonable person, I think I'd probably win that argument. <laughs> Um, but really the thing is, I just, um, holding him accountable for the way he legislates is, is the best, like that's his biggest weakness and that's what needs to be exposed to voters so they can make, a, you know, good decisions on election day. Um, sp specifically, he just, you, you hit your, you hit the nail on the head. Um, he, he does look like a guy that'd be fun to have a beer with. Um, maybe he, he'll have a better career in, uh, in show business after, after I beat him this November, um, because you know, the camera likes him. So let's, uh, let's see if we can foster that, that hobby into a career for him. Yeah. So, um, how are you going to show people that his legislation has hurt them personally? Cause things like the Patriot Act, you know, a lot of people don't even care if they're being spied on. And then I hate to say it, a lot of Americans are selfish. So if you talk about the situation at the border, that it doesn't affect them, they yeah. don't care. And then the other thing is, even though Crenshaw is horrible on legislation compared to what he said he was going to be, that's how everyone is. You know, a lot of Trump supporters are still absolutely in love with Trump, even though he's betrayed a lot of his campaign promises. And you can confront them on it and put the facts right in front of their face, and they still don't care. They're just like, well, he's Trump, and I support him. Um, so what 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 specific issues um, in your neighborhood, like in Houston, can uh, you really show people that you're going to improve, that he has not improved, and uh, that will hopefully get you to the point where people realize that you're the one who wants to help them and that Dan Crenshaw doesn't care? Well, I, I, like, to, I like to position myself kind of as a stark contrast to Crenshaw in a lot of ways. Um, he spends all of his time on social media hawking his book or, or you know, going after Nancy Pelosi and blaming everything under the sun under Democrats. And, you know, that that's it's it what it it uh, results in basically empty rhetoric. Um, I I actually ha I'm, I'm a Houston native. I've I've grown up here my whole life. Like I said, I've got the family here. I know this. I know this community. In fact, just this morning, I spent um, several hours out in the heat at, at the uh, Energy Stadium where the Texans play, um, helping the Houston Food Bank load up uh, and distribute food into people's cars. The line of cars was heartbreakingly long. And these are people who can't, you know, have lost their jobs. They can't work and they are completely and totally reliant on, you know, the help from charity to be able to even eat. And, you know, I was out there for, you know, five hours this morning loading, just loading, you know, he heavy uh, boxes of food into people's trunks in the back of their trucks. And um, the, the, the wait, I asked a few of them how long they'd been in line in their cars um, in the parking lot as it zigzagged around for about an hour to an hour and a half just to be able to get some food. And that's that's crazy. I mean, we're at the point where our economy is so broken that people are having to result to basically bread lines in order to eat. And yeah. so anyway, standing up and actually helping out, helping Houstonians, helping, you know, the people of the city and the state, you know, when they're, you know, when they're hurting and when they need help, that's a lot better than just sniping at people on Twitter, um, which is, you know, what happens. So. 
without without coming across too negatively, though, I, I I really can't fault you know the Trumps and the Crenshaws of the world for behaving the way they do because it it works. What they're what they're doing is they're creating an us versus them mentality, um, and they are rallying people behind a story that is totally you know divorced from the way they actually legislate. So you have people who are just so angry at what the um, evil other could do that they abandon reason. They they don't look, they don't follow up. They just say, okay, this is the person who's going to beat that guy I really hate. And it's it's a really negative outcome of the way our voting system is. Um, so a couple of actual solutions I have for that are um, in, in implementing term limits for Congress. Uh, number one, that would help out a lot. You, you get rid of the, the incentive for people to just get entrenched and stay there forever. Uh, get uh, Changing the voting system right now with the winner take all, uh, you just have, it, it's just a slugfest over who you hate the most, not who you actually believe in. Um, adopting policies like ranked choice voting or approval voting, which I'd recommend looking the, both of those up if you don't know what they are, would allow people to pick who they actually would like to lead and not pick who they think can win because they don't want someone else to win. It's a lot more of a positive uh, stance. Um, yeah. Another thing is um, we really need to be reaching out, not just to the extreme fringes of the parties, um, you know, to get so we don't get primaried, um, you know, for the Republicans and Democrats, but reach out to everyone. And this, if you're going to be a representative and you are representing 19 percent of the population, then something's wrong. Um, what you're doing at that point is just appeasing and keeping them angry and whipped up so that you can stay in power. You're and you're completely ignoring the rest of your constituency, which is not what representatives of any any government position should do. Right. Um, I had uh, Darren Hamilton on the show last night, and he listed almost all the same things that you just did for voting reform. And I'm really glad to hear libertarians start talking about that because they need to realize without these reforms, nothing's going to change. You know, we need to have our system, uh, it needs to be transparent and it needs to be representative of what the people want because it's moved so far away from that that we're not even, uh, most people don't even bother to vote anymore. Um, do you want to talk a little bit, I've heard specifically about your idea for uh, allowing people not to go to the uh, polls to vote, but also making sure that we don't have any voter fraud. Sure. Um, so this is actually something that is not a U.S. you know, representative job. It's just something that I see a solution here in Texas that that could use it, uh, fixing. Um, so to give, give you some more context, uh, Texas uh, legislator, legislators meet once every two years for a legislative session. So there's some good side and some bad side of that. Uh, the good side is that you don't have to constantly worry about what they're passing next. You can just like save your outrage for a specific short amount of time. Um, the downside is uh, it's very hard to react to emergency situations like we find ourselves in now. Um, so the Texas Democrats tried to allow uh, statewide mail-in uh, balloting for people uh, since you know the pandemic's going on and they want to allow people to be responsible and safe and not have to uh, amass in large crowds just to exercise their their civic duty. And the Republicans screamed, you know, screamed foul, and they said, no, this is going to open up a can of worms for voter fraud. Both sides have very legitimate points, and they should be acknowledged and recognized and not just dismissed and outright. So the plan that I came up with and proposed uh, is um, called a, the Texas Safe, uh, safe Ballot uh, Option, where um, in Texas, you can uh, renew your auto registration uh, just by going up to your grocery store and their little customer service desk. And they can print off your little receipt and you can get your sticker that you need to put up on your car every year. That's not a big deal. It's an existing system that the government has a partnership with all these grocery stores. Now, my plan would allow you to use that those that distribution method to just go and get your uh, show your voter ID and print off your, your personalized ballot for everything that is local all the way down to your precinct. And um, allow that allow you to pick those up up to a month ahead of early voting starting. So that early voting in Texas starts on October 19th. So September 19th, presumably, if this gets passed, you'd be able to go to your grocery store, get your ballot, and then you'd have four weeks to actually research all of the names on the ballot and make an informed decision about who you want to support. So in addition to being safer, it also allows for more informed voters. I can think of a few politicians who maybe don't want more informed voters, but uh, I think that this is overall good for, you know, for our society and for the environment in which we live. So the 
the the part of it that retains the safety uh, or the voter integrity rather to uh, prevent fraud is that whenever you drop this off during um, you would drop it off at a regular polling location during um, you know during the normal early voting or election day periods and you'd still have to sign uh, your your name just like you do if you vote in person so you could have it where you drive up sign a clipboard you know get a hand wipe for the pin you just touched and drop off your printed ballot and it's I've uh, I've personally called every Texas legislator, um, House and Senate, and emailed them uh, with the information about this proposal. I've had a few nibbles back of people saying, oh, that's interesting, maybe for next time. And I've said, no, you need to call an emergency legislative session so we can get this through in time to get the systems able to print the ballots by September. It is the middle of July right now. And if you don't get on it now, you're not going to be able to have a reasonable solution that is both safe and uh, secure. One other thing that adds another wrinkle to this is that Texas fortunately recently uh, got rid of straight ticket party uh, voting. So it used to be that you could just go up and check an R and walk away in five seconds and it voted for people who you don't even know at all just because of the letter they have next to their name. And uh, thankfully, Texas uh, got rid of that, um, which gives a slight advantage to down ticket libertarians like myself. Um, so where people can go down the list and say, you know what, I heard that Dan Crenshaw guy likes red flag laws. Who's well, I'm not going to vote for a Democrat. Who else is running there? That OK, there's Libertarian. Let me vote for him. <laughs> and, um, but that means it's going to take a lot longer for voting. And if we're still doing social distancing where we have to keep six feet apart and it's taking longer to vote um, and and adding in the time where you have to, you know, the voter, um, the vol voter, voter volunteers uh, the, or the, the poll uh, judges have to go in and sanitize each system between votes. That's going to take forever. It's going to create long lines and large crowds, which is the exact opposite of what we want during the pandemic. Um, so if you do want to learn some more about that, uh, you can uh, go to my website, shermanforcongress.com, and there's a little button that says uh, safe ballot option. So you can see more about it right there. All right. And I will put a link to your website in the description. Um, that solution makes a lot of sense. Are you sure you want to go to Washington with these types of ideas? You know, it seems like the wrong spot for you to be. <laughs> um, well, I think Washington could, could use a dose of sanity. Um, so <laughs> definitely. Um, so one thing that people who are against voter ID, they say that it uh, it makes it so really poor people can't vote because they can't afford to get an ID. So are you in favor of some sort of uh, free identification so that everyone can vote? Absolutely. I think that we should remove absolutely every obstacle to voting. And this is, this is uh, we don't want to disenfranchise anyone. We want to be inclusive. We want everyone to have their voice heard. And I, um, I, I definitely lean in the direction of, I don't care if it hurts me uh, politically. I think it's more, it's more important to have integrity and to make sure that everyone is, has the easiest po possible route to being able to vote. I mean, if it were up to me, I would allow I would allow elections from your phone. <laughs> I mean, right now, you, you can file your taxes online, but um, you can't vote online. Like everyone's got a smartphone. Um, I think that that would make uh, a, a, just a massive difference to the way uh, to the way things work and the way politicians communicate out to people. Because again, if you make it easy for that that group of people who are registered to vote and they just don't, I mean, that's a game changer. You awaken all of these people who. They could be bothered to open an app on their phone and vote real quick. I mean, it's, uh, I just, um, my preference is always to uh, be more inclusive rather than, uh, you know, rather than try to diminish people from participating. Okay. So uh, let's dive in on uh, some more of the issues. Let's go back to the ones you mentioned that are really important. So you mentioned kids in cages at the border. Um, why don't you just kind of lay out, um, in a summary, what your views on immigration reform are? What should we do to have a humane system? Uh, something a lot of libertarians support that gets a lot of people worried is open borders. What is your view on border security? How much should we have? What's reasonable? What will work? What will give us comprehensive reform? And what will be compassionate? Just kind of give us your views on that. Okay, well, from, from a security standpoint, I think that the passport system upon entry to the country is sufficient. And you have people, if, if people go through, a, you know, controlled entry and, you know, show that their information, make sure they're not wanted with Interpol or something crazy like that. I, I think that's totally fine for uh, to address security issues. Um, um, the approach that I take, though, with immigration is one that is uh, really respectful of property rights. 
And that's something that most people don't really initially expect when they think about it. Um, from, from my perspective, <clears throat> the denying a person's right to use their property how they want is um, in order to control uh, something like immigration is really wrong. Um, if a business owner wants to hire uh, someone who was not born in this country and they're, they're all consenting adults and no one's getting hurt in the process, then they absolutely have every right and should be able to just hire who they want. If they want to have an international version of, you know, monster.com <laughs> and, you know, li list job offerings and have qualified applicants fill them out and they select them, there should, the government shouldn't get in the way of that. So um, what this would do is it would allow people who uh, want to move to America to, you know, follow the American dream and make life better for themselves and their families. Um, it would streamline that process. So anyone who wanted to come work here, uh, I'm not saying instant uh, citizenship, because I think that there should be a process to make sure that you, you know, are, are going, if you do want to integrate and become a citizen, that you understand what all that entails. Um, what I like, though, is the idea of a guest worker pass, where you show up and you sign up, and then guess what? You don't have to fear, you don't have to live in the shadows, uh, fearing deportation or fearing, you know, having your family ripped apart and caged. Um, so what I'm talking about is allowing people who are consenting adults to be able to hire who they want. So that's for the business owner standpoint. So that's maybe something that not every American can really put their put themselves in those shoes and say, well, I don't own a business. I don't, I don't that's not a priority to me. But think about this, like think about what you want to do with your own uh, private property, like for your house. If you want to rent to an immigrant or sell your house to an immigrant, the government shouldn't tell you that, oh, you can't do that. Um, and that's essentially what's happening when the government is saying that these people are illegal. They, you cannot transact with them. They cannot work for you. So um, uh, Spike Cohen, the Libertarian Party vice president nominee, uh, really succinctly said it that um, Americans should have the freedom to hire, house, and host immigrants as they see fit without the government getting in the way. And I think if you address the security issues that people have um, by relying on a passport check-in type of situation and allowing people uh, have to have the ability to get plugged in and to work above the board. And yes, that means they would contribute and pay taxes, even though I don't like taxes very much. Um, it would get rid of the whole stigma of these uh, of people who think that immigrants are just a drain on the system. Because in reality, immigrants aren't eligible for welfare by and large, and they are paying sales taxes and they are paying property taxes on places that they are renting um, even if they're doing so under the board. So we need to just say, understand that these people are here and they're part of the fabric that makes America unique and special. And we need to stop demonizing people just because they were born in another place. That's something that no one has control over and it shouldn't develop or it shouldn't determine what your worth as a person is, especially not here in the land of the free. Yeah, so the Republican counter argument to that, and I think is slowly dying because people realize it's not true that they're stealing our jobs and they're taking our welfare money. I think, I think people realize that's not true. Uh, another argument though, and this comes more from the left for people who are not for open borders. They say that um, open immigration like that and allowing you to hire people for whatever you want, what that does is that allows corporations to hire Mexicans for a dollar a day or some ridiculously low price that uh, comparative to Mexico wouldn't be that bad, but Americans would never work for. And that it's really just a scheme uh, for corporate America to get rich off the back of immigrants without having to pay people a, uh, you know, a reasonable wage. What would your response to that be? Well, I think that if um, there is a market demand and pressure uh, to have lower priced goods and services that you want to pay yourself when you go to the grocery store or when you, you know, you do your online shopping, whatever. If you are shopping and you are selecting the least expensive option because that's what you can afford, then you are doing the exact same thing. So I don't see how that's something that you can really demonize. Um, additionally, if, if uh, people are working above the board, they have the guest worker passes, they're going to have a light shown on, sh shown on them that right now that they currently don't. When you have a black market of labor, um, it allows for abuses like that where people um, aren't treated with dignity and they are offered terrible wages because the employer right now can just say, I can call ICE if, if you don't want that money. If you don't, if, if that's not enough for you and, and you want to cry foul, I can just get you deported. And that's a terrible imbalance that exists because the government creates a situation where these people are not legitimate 
um, you know, they're they're treated as not legitimate, and that's this whole thing. It's a it's it's kind of a self uh, self uh, fulfilling circle where you know we just we have people who are forced into the shadows by government policy and then abused because of it. And I feel like a lot of that abuse will go away when you have when you have uh, some you know some sunshine uh, shown onto it, which act acting as a good disinfectant for that ill. Um, it also typically means that if you have a large pool of people willing to work for less, then the market's been a little bit distorted and maybe needs a correction. So not every job is going to be, you know, a fabulous high paying job. And that's just the unfortunate reality of any system. Um, there's there's some jobs that are in more higher demand. There's some jobs that are in lower demand, and that's always going to be the way it works. And depending on what you as an individual laborer can offer and contribute is what determines what people are going to pay you. So if you have a if you have a marketable skill that employers want, then you can command you know you have more room to negotiate a higher wage. Um, if you don't, then it is smart to develop one uh, so that you can have that kind of negotiation. So um, assuming that you know corporations are just going to abuse this and import immigrants in mass and uh, you know drive down the standard of living everywhere, it's kind of silly. And people still have to be able to afford to live here, and no one's going to. Um, move here and live here if they can't afford to live here. So the pay will reflect that naturally. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you just said there. Um, progressives often shoot themselves in the foot trying to protect people because they end up destroying their lives more using government that's supposedly going to protect them, but it just drives them into the shadows, as you said. I think that's a very valid point. Um, so uh, the next one is gun rights. And I think it's an interesting... Uh, situation you're in where you have Dan Crenshaw who supports red flag laws and who else, who knows what else he'll be willing to support. And then the other person was Beto O'Rourke's campaign manager. So that certainly puts you in a good position to reach out to gun owners and Second Amendment advocates, I would say. Certainly. In fact, they um, I, I recently made an infographic on my uh, campaign Facebook page that compared their quotes on red flag laws, and they're almost identical. And this is where you you have a Republican who is like the poster boy of, you know, right, the GOP right now. It looks like they're grooming him to be the next president in 2024 from the way they're, the GOP is propping him up. And he sounds exactly like the Democrat in the race. Um, her name is uh, Seema Lajavardian, by the way. And uh, she uh, she has a lot of that veto uh, money behind her right now as well, um, I've, from from what I've seen. Um, so I, I, I would uh, I, I definitely create a contrast uh, to their similar, similar uh, stance on it. Um, in my opinion, uh, it's not about just even the Second Amendment. It is about your inherent right as a person. And this should apply to any human anywhere that right. when you have the right to defend yourself and as long as you're not hurting others in the process or needlessly endangering them, like say, I'm not saying that I would, I, I don't defend wildly aiming a you know gun into a crowd with your finger on the trigger. That's not a Second Amendment right that you have, but I defend the ability to defend yourself. and. If, if you're in an urgent situation, hoping that the police will show up in a timely manner to stop whatever is happening and immediately threatening you, that's not going to work out very well for you. They'll show up and they'll they'll do the paperwork about the crime scene they found. And people deserve the right to defend themselves. And guns are a very good equalizer of that. I have a grandmother in her late 80s who keeps a gun in her purse. And, you know, if she were to be threatened, well, you know, She's not out right now because of the pandemic, but if you know she were out doing some shopping and someone threatened her, she has the ability to defend herself, and she is a woman in her late 80s, and that is something that you cannot take away from people. Um, so it's especially, especially without due process, which is what red flag laws are. I have to keep hammering that. This allows the government to just decide you're a threat and take your guns from you. That is the the founders of this country would start another war over something like that. And you have Republicans and Democrats alike pushing it now. Yeah. So uh, on that note, uh, I've seen videos of Dan Crenshaw addressing that, and he says he supports red flags, uh, red flag laws with due process, which seems oxymoronic, um, because the whole idea of red flag laws is that there is, <laughs> there's not any investigation. They just show up and take your property and then they investigate and then you have to prove that you are not guilty. It's like the, it's, it's basically habeas corpus being flipped around on its head. So that's yeah. just a complete lie. Would you agree or? 
I, I would certainly agree. And if if somebody uh, has if if the if someone is a legitimate threat, um, charge them with a crime, right. and then you and then get a warrant, and then you can take their guns. If if you're not going to charge them with a crime, and you're saying I think that they might be a threat, that's that's so thoroughly un-American. I, I can't believe any any legislator who signed an oath to defend the Constitution can can support that with good conscience. Right. <laughs> so what do we do about gun violence? Because it is a problem. Uh, obviously, we need to uh, we need to protect everyone's rights. Um, so is there a non-government solution or is there anything the government can do to counter gun violence? Uh, and there was a big shooting in your state, I think it was last year. Um, so what, what do we do to counter this pandemic, if you will, that we have across the country of gun violence? That's a really good question. And there's, um, there's not an easy answer to it. Uh, there really is not. And any politician who tells you there is, is lying. And they're just trying to fool people and get them to, you know, support what their position is. Um, right now, we really need to, as individuals, create a culture in the society where violence is not okay. It's not an acceptable way to solve problems. We have a government from the top down that uses violence as a way to accomplish goals every single day, and it has for every living person's entire lives. Um, that culture needs to stop, and it needs to change. Um, elect libertarians like me into the government, and we will work towards a more, uh, a culture where your consent matters, not just the government decides something so people with guns are going to come and enforce it. When you have that coming down from the top, you create a, uh, a culture and a society where you say, solving problems with guns is okay, you can just threaten someone with a gun to get what you want. The government does this, and it's a crime when the people do it. So, you have to change that culture. You have to instill the importance of respecting people and their rights as individuals. I, it's, it, it, it is a cultural, it is a systemic, and it's um, in many cases a mental health problem too, because none of that works when you're, um, when you're not talking to someone who's a rational person or able to hear you and understand what you're saying or connect the dots in a, a way that is based on human empathy. And you can't legislate people to not have mental illness, no matter how hard you try. What you can do is prioritize resources to help them out. Now, I don't, I don't like government programs in almost every situation. I think that the private sector or you know, people voluntarily exchanging money in exchange for goods and services is gonna work a lot better than the government doing it. But if the government is going to tax us and it is going to spend money on things, then I would drastically favor cutting a huge chunk of, say, military spending, like maybe let's stop blowing up brown people on the other side of the planet, and maybe spend some money on more mental, making more mental health care access more available here. Um, so it's really about reducing harm, which is what I'm going to get back to every time when we're talking about, um, you know, these different topics. So if um, one way that we could also, and this is this is an actual policy solution that that would significantly help, is allow people to vote with their tax dollars. Anytime they file a tax return, they should be able to select um, a certain amount of their own personal discretionary spending for how their taxes get spent. So I don't like paying for drones. I don't wanna do that. I, want, I would rather pay for something like supporting mental health or supporting education or supporting infrastructure. Uh, there's so many different ways you can positively allocate the tax dollars that if the government's gonna take them anyway, but like you should be empowered as an individual to decide how your taxes are spent. In fact, it almost that idea almost completely invalidates the uh, the job I'm running for. Um, you know, why do you need a representative if we have the ability to instantly communicate who you know what we want as people? We don't need other people to represent us. We are quite capable of expressing our opinions. Twitter <laughs> is a great example that people can express their opinions. Um, and being able to allocate your own tax dollars, I think, would solve a lot of this too. Well, man, uh, you have very nuanced answers, and uh, this is what, uh, going back to what I was saying a lot earlier, I'm glad to see people like you in the party who actually think about this and don't just have, even though you do have the doctrine of harm reduction, you don't have a rigid doctrine of, uh, you know, just a blanket statement for everything. I'm not going to, you know, check this issue out in more in depth or whatever. Like, you, you've obviously thought about all these things. Um, so I kind of want to segue to some third rail 
issues for the Libertarian Party lately. I want to talk about environmental regulation. Um, that would be one of the very few areas that I think the government has actually done a very good job. If you look to 50 years ago, if you looked at the lakes and the rivers, you know, that there was tons of pollution. And then we had the EPA. And even though the EPA has its problems, and I think we should audit it and we should cut it where it's being unreasonable, I think it's an institution that we should keep. Or uh, at least if we get rid of it, we should merge it with something else. We should have some sort of government oversight as to uh, what people are putting into the rivers, what people are putting into the air. And then the other half of that, um, I'm a big supporter of federally protected lands because um, I think, you know, when the Constitution talks about the general welfare of the people, I think that's a phrase that gets abused a lot. Uh, and basic people use it to say, oh, well, that means we can do whatever we want. And I don't think that's true. But I think the national parks are a good that every American can enjoy. And it's not, there, I don't think there's really a free market solution to it because uh, with healthcare, you can argue for a free, uh, free market solution because there's competition. You can choose this one, choose that one. There's only one Grand Canyon. And once you line it with hotels on both sides, it's done. Once you cut down all the redwoods, they're done. Uh, so if we just sell them off to the highest bidder, um, you know, I have no faith that these beautiful lands will stay protected. So, so what do you think the federal government's role should be in environmental protection and protecting our uh, natural wonders? Excellent, and I'm glad that you're not just throwing me uh, softballs here. It's, uh, it makes for a more meaningful discussion when we can actually, uh, you know, peel back the onion a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, federally protected lands separately from environmental protection. I think those are two separate topics. Um, so I'll start with environmental protection. Um, surprisingly, in a lot of ways, when you have a, um, oh, I'm sorry, it looked like you froze there. There, you're good. Um, when you have a private sector uh, motivation to, you know, preserve something, there's a fine, you know, it it works. Um, look at all of the uh, endangered species, uh, many of which are thriving. There are there are some more um, endangered species uh, native to Africa that are present here in the state of Texas because the state of Texas allows people, um, property owners, to, um, you know, to uh, raise endangered animals and in some cases they even allow hunting for them and their profit motive to have that kind of animal you know be a continued source of revenue is their private sector motivation to preserve you know those animals from going extinct so it's one of these th it's that's one of the situations where it's like that makes no sense if you allow people to kill animals without the government protecting it then they'll get killed off it's like well no there's a financial motive here now not everything is going to have a financial motive to save and there might be some, I don't know, some like weird frog or something that no one cares about that just gets, you know, steamrolled over in uh, housing development and, and then it's gone forever and no one even knew it existed. So there is some validity to worrying about environmental concerns like that. Um, so I'm not saying that we need total, you know, market chaos and just like, you know, let, let it go wild for that kind of stuff. So um, when we're talking about pollution, I think that the biggest silver bullet for solving pollution is to get rid of artificial limits to corporate liability for polluters. Absolutely. Treat it as a violation of other people's property and allow them to sue for the maximum damage that they can get. And you create a punitive uh, market-based system uh, that, pro that makes people realize it is not cost-effective to, uh, to pollute. Right now, however, you have companies that they can buy carbon credits, which is just paying the government for permission to pollute, which doesn't solve the problem. Um, you also have, like I said, these artificial limits to corporate liability that allow companies to factor in how much they actually would have to pay out as a risk analysis to decide if um, if, if, the, if if we have to pollute, is it, is it gonna be worth it? Like how much can we make versus how much, what's the total maximum this will cost? And when you have companies that don't have to worry about going out of business when they pollute and they just work it into the uh, part of their cost of doing business, you have the government systemically incentivizing pollution. Also not to mention, the US government is the single largest polluting entity on the entire planet Earth. The US government is. And this is who we want to put in charge of keeping, you know, keeping this uh, planet clean and safe. I don't buy it. 
Um, what I think are really strong are a really strong solution rather would be um, allowing non-government organizations, NGOs, uh, to have the ability to enforce ag against um, polluters and for anyone who wants to bring a suit against polluters. When you have an unlimited cap um, uh, class action lawsuit against a polluting company, you don't get B companies like BP uh, bouncing back right away uh, after pumping you know, hundreds of thousands of gallons of crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico. That just doesn't happen. A company like that gets shut down and then every other company sees what happens and operates more safely. Um, I work for an oil and gas company, so I'm, this is not something that uh, I'm not like I, I take it very seriously. Our company has we have little safety uh, meet, sub meetings before each actual meeting we have every single day. Safety has to be number one, because if it's not, then there's, you know, it, it, it damages the reputation of the, of the company. And you know, people aren't going to want that. So I think that there's a, a, a much better balance that needs to be struck between private and uh, public enforcement for uh, polluters and, you know, preservation. And wh what we have now is incentivizing all the wrong things, and it is allowing companies and individuals to minimize the risk of what they're doing without, you know, with, without a good incentive structure in place. Um, now, talking about uh, landmarks and, you know, historical, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, parks, you know, fe federal parks, um, I think there's some balance to be struck there, too. Uh, right now, the federal government owns so much, like, if you just look at a map of how much uh, of America, of how much the federal government owns, it's a lot of land. And I think that if we were to convert some of that land into um, ways uh, that we could generate profit a little bit more easily, uh, the government wouldn't have to take so much from us in the form of taxes. So whether that's land leases for cattle or, you know, mineral rights uh, granting for uh, people who are extracting, you know, oil or, or precious metals from the ground, um, there's a lot of a lot better ways that this land could be making money. Um, now, like you said, you don't want to see uh, hotels popping up along the Grand Canyon. That's a valid point too. But if you maybe allow some development you will incentivize um, more preservation. Um, and what, what that means is, let's say that you allow some hotels to not be on it or obstruct the view of it, but to be set back so that they, you know, the higher level rooms, you can actually look out your window and see. Um, that wouldn't harm the view from that side. So maybe there is a balance to be struck there. Um, I don't, I think that the uh, preservation is super important. I, I grew up as a Boy Scout and, um, you know, I've hiked Philmont in New Mexico and that's a private that, that is a private land that the uh, the owner of uh, the Philip 66 uh, you know oil company bought and left to the Boy Scouts of America uh, to actually maintain and preserve. So there are precedents uh, for private entities, not saying um, necessarily even profit seeking ones, but just private entities that could handle the preservation and uh, the upkeep for for these you know pristine parts of the U.S. that I, I'd like to be able to take you know my kids and grandkids to someday. So there are there's there's a good argument to be made, and I don't think that any one side that says this is the only way that's right um, is really worth listening or is worth listening to or is really coming from a a, a good place. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only concern there is where that balance is between being able to profit off the lands and not destroying them. So. Uh, one of the examples you gave is actually already in effect. A lot of national forests, farmers are allowed to have their cattle uh, graze on them. Um, what would be concerning is if you sell the redwood forest to somebody and then they decide to, I mean, w are there any limitations on what we would do if we were to, uh, are, are there any types of zoning laws we'd have to put in place to make sure that they weren't just destroying these lands that we were giving to them? Uh, how much would the government have control over still? Uh, what, what would be, and I, I understand you're saying that there's not really a perfect answer, but how would we keep that balance in place once the control is shifting to a private owner from, uh, you know, every person in the country? Well, you have to you have to think about what, what exactly it means for the government to own something. Does that mean that every American has a stake in it and should get a say? And if so, then maybe let the American people decide. If the American people are part owners, if they're if you want to treat them all like individual shareholders of the Grand Canyon, 
and everyone maybe every every 10 years or so um a, a nationwide uh, ballot goes out and you say hey are you cool to opening up the grand canyon to commercial development and let the shareholders of the country the people the voters decide maybe that's the answer um i'm a big fan of realizing uh my own humility and i don't have every solution to everything i do give it every i do give my issues um a lot of thought and careful thought to make sure that i you know i balance them out well but um ultimately the the concept of a a single person or single entity knowing more than the collective intelligence of everyone is just ridiculous on its face and people um have the market and as expressed by individuals making their own decisions is infinitely wiser than any kind of central organizer and i would not want to be a hypocrite myself and presume to be able to do that right um I understand what you're saying. The only thing is, uh, I mean, if we had voted on preserving the Redwood Forest back when it became a national park, I'm sure it would have been voted down. I'm sure people would have rather profited off of the wood, you know, from the trees. But in hindsight, when we protect these things and we, uh, you know, maybe against the will of some people even sometimes, uh, it turns out being for the greater good in the long run, like uh, I think it's uh, Shenandoah National Park. Um, I think there was actually some land that was taken from private um, owners. And obviously that sounds terrible on its face, but it's kind of like with the interstates and with everything. Like, um, is there ever a balance where it's like where we have to realize that something is worth the greater good? for everybody in the long run, if it's going to hurt a couple, is there, is there any balance there or is it always absolute is my question. I guess. Um, so I, I am a, I'm a not a big fan of the government forcing people to off of their land that they own. Um, I think that if someone owns land and it's desirable to the government, then the government should up that dollar amount until they say yes. Um, I, I don't think there's any point where the government can say, sorry, this is going to benefit everyone. So, this isn't yours anymore. I just, that's wrong. Um, that's, that's completely goes against the idea of private property. And right. if the government can, then no one owns property in this, this, this country, the government owns it all. And we're just deluded renters, uh, you know, living under, uh, uh, an aggressive landlord. And that's not America, not at all. Um, now when you have, uh, issues, when you're talking about like highways and, you know, they, the government does need to buy sometimes people's land in order to expand or <clears throat> redirect new highways. I just think that they should make a fair market offer. And if the people say no, then they need to, you know, figure out a way to go around it. It's it, it, when you start saying the greater good as a justification to violate individuals, you're saying that everyone is susceptible to being violated. And that is not the greater good. Um, we need to come up with voluntary solutions and we need to come up with ways that you can help people understand, you know, appeal to their sense of community and say, hey, you're really community, you're, you would be really contributing to everything by getting on board with this. We want to pay you a lot of money. Here you go. That's going to work a lot better than the government saying, um, here, you have to sell and your rights don't matter. And there, there's a good way to do things and a bad way to do things. And uh, the status quo definitely leans towards the bad way to do things in many cases. So property rights matter, individual individuals matter and their choice matters um if if enough people want if you're if it really that greatly affects the greater good then you can have individual you can the government could even open up a system where people can toss money in to up the bid if if it's going to affect that many people crowdsource it and you can get that dollar amount up and you can get society to say this is actually something we need i'm willing to put my money where my mouth is and help buy that so that we can have this uh, infrastructure expansion program. And that is a solution that is based on voluntary interaction and you aren't using violence or you know threats of violence from the government to accomplish something. Mm -hmm. So I completely agree with that premise. And uh, something I've said on Twitter before was actually, if you value the individual over the collective, the collective will benefit if you value the collective over the individual, the individual will suffer. And I think that's very true. And that's basically what you were just laying out there. The only question is um, how far that goes, because some people could be absolutists and they could say uh, traffic lights violate my personal liberty. You know, they can take it to ridiculous measures. 
So um, that that's a big critique a lot of people have of the Libertarian Party, you know, that we're crazy, that we don't think there should be any rules at all. Um, what purpose do rules and laws have? And I, I know you're going to say protecting people, their property, and their rights. But is there a place for safety? I mean, does safety have, does the government have any place where it needs to enforce safety? Should you be required to have a driver's license to drive a tractor trailer or, you know, um, things like that? And there, then we could get into a, a conversation about the balance between control and safety. I'm saying just safety. Like, does the government have a responsibility to, um, to enforce some safety rules? So I think that what we need to do, and I touched a little bit earlier on this and when I started talking about legalizing marijuana, but getting rid of victimless acts. I think yep. that if you, um, if you have laws against uh, what would be a reasonable threat to others, even if you're not directly harming them, if you're reasonably threatening them, then those laws make sense. So traffic laws, in my opinion, fall under that category. If you are driving erratically, you know, going in and out of lanes or going through red lights, even if you don't hit anyone, you are absolutely threatening to end other people's lives. And they don't really get a say in the, in, in the matter because you are not driving in a predictable, safe way. So if we're talking about ways to reduce harm, um, laws that deal with people, you know, who are providing credible threats to the safety of others, that's something that makes sense. I think that if you are talking about, you know, and I, I'm going to go there, um, when you have law enforcement pulling, you know, black people over for busted taillights and then shooting them in front of their kids, uh, which is something that happened, Philandro Castile, uh, Castile is who that was, um, that's wrong. This guy wasn't hurting anyone. They could have just, if they pulled him over, said, hey, just let you know um, your taillights out, you might want to get that fixed. And like the the fact that um, this was a this was a guy who he was a he was a legal gun owner. He announced that he had his firearm in in the glove box, and they shot him. He wasn't reaching for it. He was complying with what they said, and they pulled him over because of a busted taillight. When you have that kind of stuff and people, the government taking lives, that's wrong. That's not good. When you have laws against um, you know drunk driving, where you're you, you if you know, the person isn't even in their right state of mind at that point, and they are credibly threatening other people's lives, that's something that should be punished. If someone has a drink or two after, you know, work, and then they head home, and they drive perfectly safely, and, and they're okay, that's not somewhere, something that they're really threatening. So when you have, like, this, you know, this, um, what you have is, it's, it's laws that are not based on a credible or reasonable judgment. You just have, these are the laws they are written in stone, so we must enforce them, and the people who enforcing are enforcing them have guns, so guess what they're going to use? And um, I know we're getting way off topic here because you're asking me about, like, reasonable safety laws, but it just, it there's there's a lot of overlap because anytime you have a law against something that isn't credibly uh, protecting someone's life or, you know, their, their property, you, what you're doing is you're creating a situation where the government with its armed employees is going to create conflict. And there is so much unrest right now in this country based on that single premise. So I wanna make sure that any topic we discuss when it comes to um, you know public safety actually has the safety of the public in mind uh, when it comes to enforcement. Absolutely. Well, we're coming up on like an hour here. I, I would like to do another video with you sometime. I think if we go for too long, no one will watch this, but I would like to have you back on the show again because I think you're a very interesting person with good ideas. Um, and you Thanks. certainly have my endorsement, whatever that's worth. And uh, I just want I want to give you the last word. Tell people how they can help you. Uh, you know, Tell them about what your campaign looks like going forward. What do you need from us? Uh, Great. Well, what I what I really need is people who um, are engaged on social media. Reach out to reach out to your local media, like actual media sources. Follow your follow your local broadcasters, your local writers for your newspaper, and tweet them about good candidates. Um, they're not going to write about us if they don't think there's any demand out there, and they're not going to write about us if it's just our campaigns reaching out. Trust me, I've tried a lot of that. Um, I've been mentioned one time in the Houston Chronicle uh, since December 2019. And that's ridiculous. Uh, I just recently shared an article um, where 
uh, someone was criticizing the, um, you know, the ineffective and back and forth uh, and miscommunication that, uh, that Dan Crenshaw has been giving about the COVID-19 response. And they got a really good quote from SEMA and I didn't get a call or a text or anything. So reach out to your local media, your local writers, your local uh, broadcasters and say you wanna hear more about libertarians because getting the media to let, you know, to communicate our message to the greater public is going to get traction. What we're saying is good. We have a good product that we're offering. We're just not getting any airtime, so no one's seeing the commercials for us, so to speak. Oh, it looks like my dog's hungry right now, so <laughs> you're right to call this. Um, if you want to give me a follow, I mentioned my website earlier, Sherman for Congress. Um, I'm going to go ahead and spell it out because my name is misspelled constantly. S-C-H-E-I-R-M-A-N uh, for Congress.com. Uh, you can follow me on uh, Facebook at uh, Sherman for Congress. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Vote Sherman. And on Instagram at also for uh, and also on Instagram at Sherman for Congress. Uh, Reed, I really want to appreciate and just thank you for having uh, for doing this. I know that you just recently started interviewing uh, candidates, and I think it's gonna. I think the more um, you know, the more we can do to get our message out there, the better. So really, thank you. Absolutely, man. All right, guys, go to his website. Like I said, I have it linked in the video description. This guy makes sense. He's way better than the actor they've got in there right now. So go help him out. Do whatever you can.